Gaining a practical understanding of mechanical power transmission components has been one of, one of the most useful and practical concepts I have learned as a mechanical engineer. I have designed hundreds of devices, and most required me to figure out a way to transfer power from an engine or electric motor to the moving parts of the machine. What does power transmission mean? Most machines require a source of power, either an electric motor or a gasoline engine or something similar, which usually produce power in the form of a rotating shaft. The end users of this power are the moving parts of machines that perform useful tasks. Power transmission components connect the source of power with the moving parts of the machine. This can be accomplished in many ways. A direct drive allows the moving part of the machine to rotate at the same speed as the power source. Gears can be used to reduce speed and increase torque. Chain and sprockets also transmit mechanical power and can reduce speed and increase torque. V-belts and pulleys are another way of transmitting power. Timing belts and pulleys are also a common way of transmitting mechanical power. A transmission can condition the power so that it is at the right speed and torque that the machine needs. A common misconception about transmissions is that they somehow magnify the power. That is completely incorrect. Gear ratios do not increase power. They simply trade speed for torque. To calculate rotational power, you just take the torque and multiply it by the speed. If a gear ratio causes the speed to go down by a factor of, say, 2, then the torque will go up by a factor of 2, which results in no change in the power due to the gear ratio. As a matter of fact, in real life, the power actually goes down because of inherent friction and inefficiency in the transmission. Power certainly does not go up. In this video, we will discuss the most common types of mechanical power transmission components. We will begin by reviewing direct drive shaft couplings, then we will discuss gear systems, followed by chain and sprockets, then V-belts and pulleys, and finally we will talk about timing belts and pulleys, also known as synchronous belt drives. Topic number one, direct drive components. We won't spend much time on this since you have already watched a video and completed an assignment on different methods for transferring torque and power from a shaft. The most common method is using a machine key where a groove is machined into a shaft and a square key is placed in the groove. The component that will attach to the shaft also has a key slot. The machine key forces the component to turn with the shaft. Tapered keys, also known as gib head keys, are used in a similar way. Woodruff keys fulfill the same purpose but don't risk sliding along the length of the shaft. Spline shafts are more expensive but are able to transfer higher torques. I showed several types of shaft couplings in a previous video. This is a rigid coupling which is low cost but requires that the shafts be closely aligned with each other. In most cases, however, it is difficult to make sure that the shafts are aligned. Misalignment can be parallel misalignment or angular misalignment. There are many types of shaft couplings that can handle various magnitudes of misalignment. This is a spider coupling. Here is a bellows type coupling. Here is a type of coupling that allows large misalignment but cannot transfer much torque. And here is a typical U-joint coupling. Now let's talk about another type of mechanical transmission component, gears. There are several different types of gears and gear systems. Spur gears are probably the most familiar to you. Notice that spur gears require that the input and output shafts be parallel to each other. Helical gears are similar to spur gears but result in quieter operation. However, they also result in thrust loads. You can see that since the gear teeth are angled, the forces between the meshing teeth will cause the gears to want to slide along the axis of the shaft, which is what we call a thrust load. This requires more expensive bearings to support these axial loads. Helical gears not only accommodate parallel output and input shafts, but they also can be arranged to accommodate shafts that need to be at 90 degrees to each other. Bevel gears look like this and enable right angled shafts. There are also helical bevel gears that are quieter during operation. Worm drives look like this and accommodate right angled shafts. These gear systems allow very large reduction ratios in a small compact space. However, they are not as efficient as other types of gears since the worm gear teeth slide on the pinion gear teeth resulting in energy loss in the form of heat. Rack and pinion systems convert rotational motion into linear motion and planetary gear systems have been developed to create complex and innovative reduction ratio combinations. The tooth of a typical spur gear has a very complex shape called an involute. Here is a graphic simulation from Wikipedia demonstrating why this involute shape is so important. You will notice that the involute shape results in an unchanging line of action of force between the gear teeth. The angle of this line of action is called the pressure angle. You will also notice that the involute shape allows the meshing gear teeth to always be in rolling contact with no sliding. This results in a very efficient way of transmitting power. There is very little energy loss because there is no sliding contact. An important concept all engineers need to understand is how gears are specified. Or in other words, if you wanted to purchase a gear, how would you tell someone what you need? Gears are specified by diametral pitch, DP, pressure angle, PA, width, and the number of teeth. 
For example, you could tell someone to please purchase a 10 dp 20 degree PA 1 inch wide gear with 30 teeth. Here is a page from your brain book that summarizes the main parameters of a typical spur gear. The first parameter listed is the diametral pitch and you can see that this is calculated by dividing the number of teeth by the diameter. Diametral pitch is in units of teeth per inch and indicates how large the gear teeth are. It is a similar parameter to the threads per inch for bolts. A smaller number means larger teeth. The pitch diameter is another important parameter. It is the diameter of the pitch circle which refers to the circle where the gear teeth mesh together. The number of teeth on a gear is also a very important parameter which is used in calculating the pitch diameter and in determining gear reduction ratios. For instance, the smaller gear in this figure has 12 teeth and the larger gear has 18 teeth. This would result in a gear ratio of 1.5 to 1. The large gear would turn 1.5 times slower than the smaller gear, but would have 1.5 times higher torque. We have already discussed that the pressure angle of a gear refers to the angle of the line of force between the meshing teeth. Center distance is another important concept that engineers need to understand, and I will discuss this in more detail in just a moment. But before discussing center distance, I want to take a moment to help you understand diametral pitch. Remember when we talked about threads, the word pitch referred to the distance from one thread to the next. You will also remember that ANSI inch threads are specified like this, where the 13 refers to the number of threads in one inch of length. If I measured one inch of length, there would be 13 threads in that distance. Well, gears are very similar. The distance from one tooth to the next is the pitch. We call it the circular pitch simply because the distance is an arc rather than a straight line. We can also measure one inch of circular length and count how many teeth are in that distance, just like we did with threads. In this case, we are showing six teeth per inch. The number of teeth per inch can be calculated by taking the number of teeth around the entire gear and dividing it by the circumference of the pitch circle. Or in other words, n represents the number of teeth, which is divided by pi times the pitch diameter. But pi is a weird number, and it makes the calculation more challenging to do in our heads. What if we decided to just get rid of the pi so that the calculation was easier? Well, that wouldn't give us the circular number of teeth per inch anymore, but it is an easier number to calculate, and it does still give us an indication of how big the gear teeth are. So engineers decided to stick with that concept and invented the term diametral pitch, which is simply the teeth per inch calculation without the pi in it. Now let's talk about how to calculate the center distance between gears. This is an important concept for design engineers. If we're designing a gear system, we certainly need to know how close we should mount the gears to each other. If we mount them too close or too far away from each other, we will lose energy and be inefficient since we are not taking advantage of that complex involute tooth shape. The key to determining the ideal center distance between gears is to understand that the mesh point of the gears should be at the location where the pitch circles intersect. The diameters of the pitch circles are easy to calculate if you know the diametral pitch and the number of teeth. We can just do a little algebra to the diametral pitch equation that we just talked about. And If we take the radius or one half the diameter of the large gear and add it to the radius or one half the diameter of the small gear, we will get the ideal center distance. Let's do a quick example problem. Suppose you are designing a device requiring two 10 dp gears to mesh and transmit power. The small gear has 20 teeth and is being driven by a motor at 1800 rpm. The larger gear needs to be turning at 600 rpm. Determine all of the parameters indicated in the table. Well, the rotational speed of gear number one is 1800 rpm as stated in the problem, and the rotational speed of gear number two is 600 rpm as stated in the problem. Since the larger gear needs to turn three times slower than the smaller gear, we need to have a gear ratio of three to one. If we want the gears to mesh, both of them need to have the same size teeth. If the smaller gear has 10 diametral pitch teeth, then the larger gear must also have the same size teeth, 10 diametral pitch. The problem stated that the smaller gear has 20 teeth, and in order to obtain the three to one gear ratio, the larger gear needs to be three times larger and therefore have 60 teeth. Now if we remember the concept that the diametral pitch is simply the teeth per inch equation without the pi in it, we can do a little algebra to determine the pitch diameter of the smaller gear by taking the number of teeth divided by the diametral pitch and find that the small gear is two inches in diameter. We can do the same for the larger gear to find that it has to be six inches in diameter, which of course turns out to be three times bigger than the smaller gear. 
If we take the radius of the smaller gear, which is one half the diameter, or one inch in this case, and add it to the radius of the larger gear, which is one half the diameter, or three inches in this case, we will discover that we will need to mount these two gears four inches apart in order to get them to mesh in an efficient manner. I have put a catalog page from the Boston Gear Company in your brain book so that you could see that gears really are specified by diametral pitch, where a large diametral pitch means very small gear teeth and a small diametral pitch means very large gear teeth. You will also notice that gears really only come in two common pressure angle designs, 14 and a half degrees and 20 degrees. Here is a catalog page for gear racks and you can see that they are also specified by diametral pitch and pressure angle. Here are some commonly available internal ring gears which are also specified by diametral pitch and pressure angle. Now let's go on to topic number three and talk about ANSI standard roller chain and sprockets. The general population does not understand the differences between gears and sprockets. These are very different components. Gears are meant to mesh directly together while sprockets will not mesh together at all rather they are meant to transmit power using a chain. Gear teeth have a complex involute shape, while sprockets have simple shaped teeth designed to receive a cylindrical shaped roller from a chain. Gears are specified by their diametral pitch, which is the teeth per inch calculation without the pi in it, and sprockets are specified simply by the pitch, or distance from one tooth to another. Perhaps cyclists have contributed to the confusion between gears and sprockets because most of them use the wrong term. Bicycles have sprockets, not gears. It is important for engineers to know how standard sprockets are specified, or in other words, if you wanted to purchase a sprocket, how would you tell someone what you need? Sprockets are specified using the ANSI number, which refers to the pitch, and the number of teeth. For example, you might tell someone to please purchase an ANSI number 40 sprocket with 32 teeth. The ANSI number 40 refers to half-inch pitch, which means that there is a half-inch distance from one tooth to the next. I have included this page in your brain book, which shows the standard ANSI number chain sizes and the pitch for each size. The pitch is the distance from one link of chain to the next. It is also the straight line distance from one tooth to the next on the sprocket. The table also shows the roller diameter for each ANSI chain size. The roller diameter is this dimension of the cylindrical roller that fits between each tooth of the sprocket. The table also shows the tensile strength of each ANSI size chain. The tensile strength is the amount of tension the chain can handle before breaking. However, this number is not nearly as important as the working load, which takes a factor of safety into account. When designing a chain drive, we should make sure the tension in the chain doesn't exceed the working load limit. Now let's talk about how we can calculate the diameter of a sprocket. First, it is important to realize that cylindrical rollers of the chain will sit into the spaces between the teeth. The pitch is this distance here, which is a straight line distance, not a curved distance, since the links of the chain will go straight from tooth to tooth. The diameter of the circle, which goes to the center of the chain link rollers, is called the pitch diameter. Let's derive a simple equation for computing the pitch diameter of a sprocket. First, it is important to realize that the pitch is the straight line distance from tooth to tooth. Now let's go ahead and draw this triangle. If we know how many teeth there are in the sprocket, we can find this angle by taking 360 degrees and dividing it by the number of teeth. Now let's make a right triangle by looking at one half of the larger triangle. We will bring it out here so we have more room to write. Since it is only one half of the larger triangle, this distance is only one half of the pitch. And this angle is only one half of the angle in the larger triangle, which can be simplified to 180 degrees divided by the number of teeth. This distance here is the radius of the pitch circle, which is equal to one half the pitch diameter. Since this is a right triangle, we can use the definition of the sine of an angle, which is equal to the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse, or p over 2 divided by d over 2. If we simplify and solve for d, we get this relatively simple equation, where d is the pitch diameter of the sprocket. Now we are ready for an example problem. Suppose sprocket number one has 12 teeth and is connected to a 10 horsepower motor turning at 500 RPM. Determine the maximum tension expected in the chain. Also determine if ANSI number 50 chain is sufficient for this application. Well, the first logical step is to determine the maximum amount of torque that can be developed by a 10 horsepower motor turning at 500 RPM, which will be directly transferred to the sprocket number one. There is an equation in your brain book that you saw when learning about electric motors. This equation really isn't rocket science. It just comes from the fact that power equals torque times speed and then needs the appropriate unit conversion factors so that the result is in horsepower. If the torque is in foot-pounds and the speed is in rotations per minute, and if all of the conversion factors are bundled into one number, 5252, then you will get the answer in horsepower.
Since we want to calculate torque, we will need to do a little algebra to get this equation. And since we know that we have a 10 horsepower motor turning at 500 RPM, we can calculate that the maximum torque that this motor can develop is 105 foot-pounds. We can multiply that by 12 to get the torque in inch-pounds. Next, let's calculate the pitch diameter of sprocket number one. We will use the equation that we just derived. Since we are considering using ANSI number 50 chain, we can look in the brain book to see that this size chain has a pitch of 5 eighths of an inch, or 0 0.625. If we divide it by the sine of the angle, we will find that the pitch diameter of this small sprocket is just over 2.4 inches. To understand how tension is developed in the chain, you have to realize that the motor is turning sprocket number one and sprocket number two is connected to a machine that has work to do and doesn't want to turn. That results in a tug of war between sprocket number one who's being forced to turn and sprocket number two who doesn't want to turn. That tug of war causes tension in the chain. Now clearly sprocket number one will turn if we have a big enough motor, but the machine could put enough load on sprocket number two that we can think of it as being in static equilibrium when determining the maximum tension in the chain. Therefore we know that in the worst case the torque developed by the motor will be balanced by a force multiplied by a leverage distance, which is the radius of the small sprocket. Here is the equation showing the torque balance. We can do a little algebra since we are interested in the tension and get this equation. And we know that the max torque is 1,261 inch-pounds. And we have to take one half the pitch diameter of 2.415 inches to get the radius, which results in a maximum chain tension of just over 1,000 pounds. If we look at the table in the brain book and focus on ANSI number 50 chain, we will see that the working load limit for this size chain is 1,430 pounds. And since we only expect a maximum tension of 1,044 pounds in the chain, we are okay using this size of chain. Now let's move to topic number four on V-belts and pulleys. We won't go into the same depth with these components, but I at least want to introduce them to you. V-belts have to seat in a V-groove on a pulley and rely on friction between the belt and pulley to transmit power. If the belt is too loose, you won't get the friction you need and the belt will slip. Here are a couple benefits of this type of drive. They have a lower relative cost and are quieter than chain drives. However, they are much less efficient since they rely on friction between the belt and pulley and lose energy as the belt has to continually pull out of the groove as it moves around the loop. The friction also causes these belts to have a higher wear rate, and because they rely on friction to transmit power, they require a much higher pretension of the belts, which results in higher side loads on the shafts and bearings. Here is a page that I put in your brain book showing common V-belt sizes. You will notice that they are specified by letter sizes, A, B, C, D, and E, and also by numeric V sizes, such as 3V, 5V, and 8V. In order to help the V-belt be able to wrap around smaller pulleys and turn sharper corners, you can purchase cogged belts, or belts with grooves. These grooves are not designed to engage with teeth on the pulleys. They are just meant to help the V-belt be more flexible. If you want to purchase a cogged V-belt, you would simply put an X after the size, for instance, AX, BX, CX, DX, etc. That brings us to our final topic, number five, timing belts and pulleys, which are sometimes called synchronous drives. Pros of this type of power transmission system are that they are quiet, they don't slip on the pulley since the belt and pulley have engaging teeth, they have higher efficiencies since they don't rely on friction like V-belts, and they don't require as high of pretension as V-belts. A con is that they are generally more expensive than V-belts. Here is a page I put in your brain book showing common size timing belts and pulleys. You will notice that they are specified with a letter which refers to the pitch or distance between teeth. The XL size has a 1 5th inch pitch, the L size has a 3 8 inch pitch, and the H size has a 1 half inch pitch. Determining the pitch diameter of a timing belt is an important concept for engineers to understand. A key concept is to recognize that when the belt goes around the pulley, the outside of the belt stretches and the inside of the belt compresses, which means that the pitch line of the belt is the neutral axis which neither stretches nor compresses as it goes around the pulley. Here is the pitch line shown in the figure. It defines what we call the pitch circle. The diameter of this pitch circle is called the pitch diameter, which is larger than the pulley itself and is the most important parameter of a timing belt pulley. Calculating the pitch diameter is pretty straightforward as long as we recognize that the pitch line of the timing belt becomes curved as it travels around the pulley. We begin by determining the circumference of the pitch circle, which is simply the pitch multiplied by the number of teeth around the entire pulley. We also recognize that the circumference can be calculated by multiplying pi by the pitch diameter. 
If we do a little algebra and solve for d, we obtain a pretty simple equation for the pitch diameter of a timing belt. Now that we know how to calculate the pitch diameter of an individual pulley, let's move on to calculating the total length of the timing belt itself. In this first example, we will assume that the timing belt is connecting pulleys of equal size. As a design engineer, we usually have some idea of the center distance that we would like to have between the pulleys. You can see that the total length of the belt is simply made up of two of these straight sections and two of these curved sections. I can find the total length of the timing belt by taking two center distances and adding two half circles, which equates to one full circumference. I can find the circumference one of two ways, multiplying the pitch by the number of teeth around one of the pulleys, or multiplying pi by the pitch diameter. Here's a quick example with numbers. What is the total length of timing belt I would need to connect two 30 tooth H series pulleys that were 17.3 inches apart? The center distance is 17.3 inches, and the belt needs to be long enough to accommodate these two straight sections and these two curved sections. So I simply calculate the belt length I need by taking two center distances and two half circles, which equates to one full circumference of the pulley. Here are the numbers. The center distance is 17.3 inches. The pitch of the H-series timing belt is one half inch, which we determined from the table in the brain book. And each pulley has 30 teeth, as stated in the problem which comes out to be 49.6 inches. However, it is important to note that timing belts only work if their total length is a whole number increment of the pitch, since you can't have a belt that has one spot with only a partial space for a tooth. Therefore, we could conceivably either purchase a 49.5 inch belt or a 50 inch belt, but not a 49.6 inch belt, since that is not an even increment of a half inch pitch. I would probably pick a 49 and a half inch belt and would then have to adjust the center distance between the pulleys to accommodate this length. In a practical sense, we may not even be able to purchase a 49 and a half inch belt just because that size, while possible, may not be readily available from a vendor. What about determining lengths of more complex belt pulley configurations? If the pulleys are not equal in size, the calculation is not that straightforward. And what if we have something even more complex like this? How would you determine the length of belt you need for this application? Well, if I were you, I would take advantage of CAD and just quickly draw it and measure it. Let me show you what I mean. Let's work through this complex example together. Suppose we are designers and need to know which length of belt to order for this application. We decide that this distance needs to be around 10 inches and this distance needs to be around 7 inches. This pulley is a 12 tooth L series and so is this one and this pulley is a 30 tooth L series. We will first need to determine the pitch diameters of these pulleys by taking the pitch times the number of teeth, which is the circumference, and dividing it by pi to get the diameter. We can look up the pitch of L series timing belt in the brain book and we find that it is 3 eighths of an inch. If we multiply it by 12 teeth and divide by pi, we find that the pitch diameter of this pulley is 1.432 inches. This pulley is the same size since it has the same number of teeth and we can determine the pitch diameter of this 30 tooth pulley the same way. We take the 0.375 inch pitch and multiply it by 30 teeth and divide by pi and find that the pitch diameter of this pulley is 3.581 inches. Now we are ready to make a quick sketch of this design in a CAD system to measure how long of a belt we need for this application. You'll notice in SOLIDWORKS that all I did was create a 2D sketch. Let's go into that sketch so that you can see I just drew three circles, I spaced them at the correct distance, placed some correct constraints, and placed the correct diameter dimensions on the pulleys. It was a very quick sketch to make. Now I can go into the Evaluate tab and choose the Measure tool, and I just pick all these entities around the perimeter. And it shows that the total length of this perimeter is 35.295 inches. So if we come back to our problem, we have found that the perimeter is 35.295 inches. I quickly went to the McMaster Car website to take a look at what size belts I could purchase from them. I looked at L-series timing belts, and I found right here that I could either purchase a 34.5 inch long belt that contained a total of 92 teeth, or a 36.7 inch long belt, which contained a total of 98 teeth. I would probably pick the 34.5 inch belt that would cost roughly fifteen dollars. 
and I would also have to live with the fact that my center distances in my design would have to be a little closer together to accommodate this shorter belt just because I couldn't buy a 35 or a 35 and a half inch long belt it just wasn't commonly available size 